Welcome into Good Morning KU. He's Farzine Vesugian. and I'm Jackson Long. It's a championship Monday, but no crimson and blue. Instead, blue, br blue blood programs Kentucky and Connecticut will meet at 8 o'clock tonight in Dallas. The Wildcats looking for their second national title in three years. UConn preceded them in 2011 with the incredible run by Kimba Walker and also won it all in 2004. How did they get there? We'll start with the Huskies win over Florida in the semifinal. Here are the highlights right here. Shabazz Napier, excuse me, no, Scotty Billiken of Florida, the SEC Player of the Year, tough basket. All Florida in the get-go, but UConn was able to come back strong. Napier there with a three-pointer. Napier here again, driving the lane with a tough right-handed lane. Florida now down 23-22 to UConn. More pressure by Boatwright in the front court. He gets the ball back for the transition slam. The second half here was all UConn, and really after the first 10 minutes, UConn had control of the game. There you see Kimba Walker and Jim Calhoun from the 2011 squad. A lob there from Boatwright to Daniels, and UConn wins the game from the semifinal and now into the championship tonight in Dallas against Kentucky. And they will be facing the Kentucky Wildcats, as you mentioned. Here it is in the second half. Harrison drives to the basket, gets it to Alex Poitras with the two-handed slam, makes it a two-point game. Under a minute, less than 20 seconds. Here's Trayvon Jackson from behind the arc as the shot clock expires, but Harrison called for the contact right there. Three free throws, misses one of them, however. So Wisconsin only up by two. Here it is, who else is it gonna be? Aaron Harrison for three, nails it. Right there, Kentucky retakes the lead with five seconds left in Wisconsin, one last Shot right there, no good. Kentucky survives and will move on to the championship. As you mentioned, the second time in three years that they will be in the championship. So a big, big game for Kentucky and just a good job overall by Kentucky, especially trailing for most of the second half and eventually pulling away in the end when it mattered the most. Kentucky, of course, an eight seed beat Wichita State, Louisville, Michigan, and then Wisconsin on the way to the Final Four, an incredible run, beat three of the last four Final Four teams from last year. Uh, that's an eight seed in Kentucky, a seven seed in UConn, and they had a, an impressive run as well. The highest combined seeds we've ever seen in the national title game. Yeah. Talk about what March has been like. I know you wrote about it today in your column for the UDK, but yeah. this has been a crazy March, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the most unreal uh, tournament we've ever seen. Before. This is the first time a seven seed is in the national championship. This is the third time an eight seed is in the championship. So history will be made. I think, you know, what fans should do, I mean, it, People love the brackets and the predictions and the odds makers in Vegas and all, but you know, just enjoy this match because this is never going to happen again uh, for for a long time. I mean, the, the, these are two unknowns, and so many experts nationally, I mean, they're unsure with their predictions. There's no confidence. No one knows what's going to happen. Even uh, Kentucky coach John Calipari even said, you know, he he knows what that team is like, but he doesn't know how they're going to come out, what they're going to do exactly, because not many people studied these teams. No one expected these two teams to make it in the finals. I think CBS Sports mentioned that I think only. Only 0.2% uh, of fans had UConn in the championship, and only 1% had Kentucky in the championship. So that just shows you. I, I think that this also adds a lot of excitement because we don't know for sure who's going to win, and it just adds to the uh, uh, uncertainty but excitement as well. Absolutely. It's probably the two best teams. I mean, it seems at this point it makes sense, right? Yeah. The two best teams playing their best ball right now. Um, Kentucky was a preseason number one, so not a huge surprise there, but what has UConn done to kind of come back from a, a slower start? I mean, you know they already beat Florida and they beat them twice now. Yeah. So, so how, how did UConn make this transformation into a championship team? You know, you mentioned they beat Florida uh, once earlier this year. A lot of people were saying, especially, you know, a lot of Florida fans, that the win was a fluke. And, you know, UConn kind of stumbled uh, during the road. They, they, they didn't have that dominant season like Kansas did or Syracuse or Duke, some of the other teams that got knocked out early in this tournament. But, uh, you know, eventually they got a, they figured it out towards the end of the season. And, you know, you saw the game against Florida the, this past week, and, you know, so some missed shots kind of helped. But, you know, you take advantage of that, and that's exactly what UConn did. And uh, UConn, one of the uh, more successful basketball programs we've seen in the last decade, and really overall, uh, found their way to the championship tonight, and well-deserving, too. Shabazz Napier versus Aaron Harrison, the point guard battle tonight at 8 o'clock in Dallas for the national championship game. We'll be back after this break with KBC 9 News Sports Director Johnny Kane on his experiences with the Final Four and to talk a little Royals baseball. Welcome back into Good Morning KU. That face you see is Johnny Kane, Sports Director, KBC 9 News. Johnny, how's it going? It's going all right. Got up uh, around breakfast time for you here. Yeah, I, we, we certainly appreciate that. <laughs> I know you're more of an afternoon, evening guy. You're a little bit of a night owl. Uh, so let's talk about this basketball championship tonight. UConn and 
Kentucky, not exactly what we thought. Of course, the area teams had a tough first weekend and couldn't really get out of the first round. Even Mizzou lost in their second NIT game. What did, is this a big surprise to you? Who did you have in your Final Four? Uh, well, the only team I had in the Final Four was Florida. I, I really thought Arizona uh, was the best team on the other side of the bracket. So, I, you know, I had Florida, Arizona, um, uh, Duke, which obviously uh, hurt my bracket early on, and then uh, uh, Michigan State. So, you know, I think a lot of people went that route if they were paying attention to college basketball this year. But, you know, I'm surprised that I heard you in your last segment talking about, you know, 0.2% of the people that had UConn in and then, you know, 1% that had Kentucky or whatever it was. I think it's interesting this year it would have been one of those bracket pools where even if you didn't know anything about basketball, <laughs> you would see the names UConn and Kentucky and somebody out there that wasn't paying attention would say, oh yeah, and they'd put them in their Final Four. So, uh, for example, the woman who won our office pool, she had Wichita State winning the whole thing and, and uh, she's going to end up winning. It's, it's amazing what happens every year in March. It truly is madness. Now, you covered it in 2008 when KU went to the uh, championship game and won that. You were at Topeka. Uh, what was your experience like uh, covering a, a local regional team in the national championship? Uh, it was the greatest professional experience of my life. Um, you know, you, you may cover a team or you may work in a certain market uh, for 25, 30 years and never have an opportunity to, champ uh, to cover a championship caliber team, let alone an actual championship team. So I remember uh, it was really emotional time. I and mean, you do get wrapped up in the teams you cover because you build relationships with the players and coaches and then you're along the ride with the rest of your peers and contemporaries in the business. And uh, it, was a, it was in San Antonio, which was one of our favorite cities growing up uh, with my family. And uh, just the whole setting was all right, you know, and I remember you know, down nine with 212 to play. And I sat there, uh, we actually were sitting courtside, and I remember it's kind of slouched in my chair thinking, you know, how did this happen? How did they, you know, how are they going to lose this game? And uh, then obviously, you know, what happened uh, What happened next? And, and uh, when Mario Chalmers hit that shot, I remember uh, I actually jumped, I leapt out of my chair at courtside and uh, feet first into security guard <laughs> that had to help me back to my chair. But I mean, just the excitement. I mean, that was what, uh, this tournament is so great. Uh, and certainly I've seen it on both sides, you know, with, with Trey Burke in Michigan last year. And then you see, uh, you know, what Aaron Harrison has done to the, you know, another Michigan team this year in Wisconsin. Uh, but to be on the other side of it, to see a shot go down, the one that Mario hit, and then to send it to overtime, we knew at that point, uh, for all intents and purposes, the game was over. The momentum had swung so big. So it was just a fun team to cover. Uh, it was just a great team. I mean, at that, I mean, that particular team was just a great team. And obviously, Cole Aldrich logged big minutes in there uh, in that Final Four. And, and uh, just some really good uh, – it was just a great – you know, Sasha Khan, Darnell Jackson, all those guys, Russ Robb. I mean, it was just – it was a really fun team to cover. Yeah, that was fun. Lots of excitement. And really what March makes is that – uh, all the excitement you can gain from a run like 2008 uh, equals the disappointment you get with the three or four years that come. So speaking of excitement, Royals excitement two and three right now after they lost to Chris Sale and the White Sox yesterday. What are your expectations? I know you've been covering the team for a couple of years. There's a lot of hype around this team. I think deservedly so. The maybe the most uh, the most talent on paper that they've had in a while. Uh, what are your expectations for this team? They lost the two early to a couple of Cy Young winners. Yeah. Uh, but but it seems like they've rebounded well at their series at home against the White Sox. Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of it, you know, you're not going to win them all, but you need to win the series. And, uh, you know, the Detroit series, even though it was abbreviated, you know, you got to find a way to win one game in Detroit at least. Uh, but winning two out of three against Chicago was great. But, you know, you look at it, of the five pitchers they faced, you know, three, obviously the two at the Cy Young with Scherzer and Verlander and then with Chris Sale, you got to, we have to beat those teams if you're going to win the division. So, you know, we beat two other pitchers, all right. But, you know, we haven't put any runs on the board. And I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, everybody knew in the off season you needed to go out and get a bat and weren't able to do that. But the way that it worked out with bringing in an Aoki, uh, you know, at your uh, number one hole and then to bring in Omar Infante, they kind of felt like then they could bring their bat, you know, Alex Gordon, and Hosmer, and just slide those down in the order and then we were going to be okay. But, you know, I think that's the biggest concern. A am I concerned five games in? Not so much because it's such a small sample size. Uh, but certainly you'd like to come out of the gate with a strong April. You know, you don't want to come out stumbling and then have to play catch up. One game below 500 through five games, I don't have a big problem with that. I just would like to see them with the ability uh, in game situations to be able to scratch another run across. Too many wasted opportunities, I think, early in the season. Uh, and I think it's too early. You know, I hear people already saying, oh, we need to put, 
you know, Alex Gordon should be batting fourth and, you know, you got to slide Butler down. Well, if your American League designated hitter is not batting fourth, then he either, either shouldn't be on the team, right, or, or you got, or you got to go out and get somebody better. So I think we got to give Butler an opportunity, but uh, if, you know, if he has too many more uh, grounds into double plays, uh, filling up my timeline on Twitter, then maybe we'll have to make, make a decision here later in the season. But right now, I wouldn't be concerned, but uh, I'm not overly ecstatic either with the offensive production. Thanks, Johnny, for joining us. Hopefully, uh, maybe, maybe some golf in the near future. That's the next time I wake you up this early in the morning. Yes, that sounds good. We'll do it, buddy. All right, thanks. That's Johnny Kane from KMBC 9 News, the sports director in Kansas City. Thanks again, Johnny, for taking us in. We'll be back after the break here with some news. Uh, stay with us on Good Morning KU. I'm Maggie. And I'm Haley. This is your Good Morning KU News Update. The United States will send more missile defense ships to Japan as part of an effort to bolster protection from North Korean missile threats. North Korea has carried out a series of missile launches in recent weeks and has warned it was preparing to test another nuclear device, prompting fresh criticism from the United States. Speaking during a visit to Tokyo on Sunday, U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel announced that two Navy destroyers equipped with missile defense systems would be deployed to Japan by 2017. As students celebrated their spring break in Southern California, some 100 people were arrested and 44 were sent to the hospital after a college party erupted into a brawl. Things got out of hand quickly after a University of California Santa Barbara police officer was hit with a bag full of bottles of alcohol. Students soon escalated to throwing rocks, bricks, and open bottles at officers as reinforcements were called immediately. Among those injured were five officers. Following days of contentious debate, the Kansas State Legislature approved a controversial bill on Sunday that provides additional funds to public schools, but also repeals teachers' tenor rights. The bill exempts public school teachers from a law that allows those who have been on the job for three or more years a due process hearing before they can be fired or have their contract non-renewed. Supporters of the bill say it will make it easier to get rid of poor teachers, while critics say it will make it more difficult for teachers to protect themselves against unjust dismissal. The bill was passed by a vote of 63 to 57, with all yes votes coming from Republican representatives. Federal officials are recalling 42,000 Mazda 6 sedans from model years 2010 to 2012 because of a fire risk tied to yellow sack spiders. Mazda recalled thousands of cars three years ago for the same reason. The most recent models do not have this issue because of new software installed in the car systems. The U.S. women's national soccer team has fired its head coach. According to the Washington Post, Tom Sermani has been removed from his position this past weekend for no significant reason. The U.S. women's team is looking to contend for a title at the 2015 World Cup and will be hoping for a replacement coach as soon as possible. And finally, America has lost a Hollywood legend. Actor Mickey Rooney has died at the age of 93. Rooney became the United States' biggest movie star while still a brash teenager in the 1930s and later a versatile child character actor as a career that spanned 10 decades. According to IMDb, he had just recently wrapped up filming for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, his 338th screen credit. 